21. The King One of the most obvious facts of Scripture is that Jesus Christ is King. Many texts can be cited to confirm this, such as Psalm 45, verses 6 and 7, compare Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8, and the fact that Jesus Christ's crucifixion was in part because of his royal status. The one charge on the cross, citing his, quote, crime, end quote, was that he was the king of the Jews. Matthew chapter 27, verse 37, Mark chapter 15, verse 26, Luke chapter 23, verse 28, John chapter 19, verse 19. This meant more than a royal claim on a little satellite state. It meant the Messiah King and the chief priests and scribes mocked Christ on the cross, saying, He saved others, himself he cannot save. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, now come down from the cross that we may see and believe. Mark chapter 15 verses 31 and 32 Our Lord did not deny this charge. He simply made it clear that his kingship was not derived from this world, but was supernatural and over this world. John chapter 18 verse 36 Moreover, the chief priests and scribes recognized the scope of his royal nature. It was linked to his deity, and they charged him with the affirmation, I am the Son of God. Matthew chapter 27, verse 43. Pretty plainly, they were crucifying one who had declared himself to be the God King of creation. The early church saw Christ as the God King and it quoted extensively from such Old Testament texts as Psalm 2, Acts chapter 4, verses 25 and 26, etc., and Psalm 110, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 24 to 28, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 20 to 22, Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 to 11, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, chapter 8, verse 1, chapter 10, verses 12 and 13, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 22, etc. Christ himself speaks of his reign and throne. Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. It is, however, unnecessary to pile text upon text to, quote, prove, end quote, Christ's kingship. The most common term applied to him in the New Testament declares him to be both God and King. That term is Lord. Kurios. It means sovereign, and it also means God. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 25. Jesus Christ is Lord. He is the God King. He is King because he is the Creator, the Redeemer, the Head of the Church, and the King of the Universe. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 24 and 28. Christ's kingship, however, has another important and central facet. He is king because he is the second or last Adam, called to replace the first Adam who forfeited his dominion mandate, Genesis chapter 1 verses 26 to 28, and fell, Genesis chapter 3 verses 1 following. By his baptism, Christ entered into his royal calling, and the voice from heaven cited Psalm 2 verse 7 in part at his baptism. Matthew chapter 3 verse 17, Mark chapter 1 verse 11, Luke chapter 3 verse 22. Christ's baptism is comparable to the formal investiture of a prince to be the crown prince, the heir to the throne. The full statement of Psalm 2 verse 7 is cited later with reference to Christ's resurrection he was now begotten, or born into the fullness of his royal estate, having conquered sin and death. Acts chapter 13 verse 33 With this victory, Christ was exalted to the right hand of God, made king of creation, and lord over all things. Psalm 2 verses 8 and 9, Matthew chapter 28 verse 18, Ephesians chapter 1 verses 20 to 22, Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 to 11. 
The second person of the Godhead always is King and Lord. Now the incarnate Christ, the God-man, gains this status as God's vicegerent, fulfilling the calling of Genesis chapter 1 verses 26 to 28. Berghoff stated the meaning very clearly. This investiture was part of the exaltation of the God-man. It did not give him any power or authority which he did not already possess as the Son of God, neither did it increase his territory. But the God-man, the mediator, was now made the possessor of this authority, and his human nature was made to share in the glory of this royal dominion. Moreover, the government of the world was now made subservient to the interests of the Church of Jesus Christ. And this kingship of Christ will last until the victory over the enemies is complete, and even death has been abolished. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 24 to 28. At the consummation of all things, the God-man will give up the authority conferred on him for a special purpose, since it will no more be needed. He will return his commission to God, that God may be all in all. The purpose is accomplished, mankind is redeemed, and thereby the original kingship of man is restored. Christ's kingship, thus, is the restoration of Adam's original kingship and of the kingship under God which we lost in Adam. Man, in his sin, rejected kingship because God's requirement for kingship means rule over ourselves and over all creation in terms of God's law word. Kingship means responsibility and work. Instead of kingship, man sought deity, to be as God. Genesis chapter 3 verse 5. At the same time, man rejected responsibility. Genesis chapter 3 verses 11 to 13. To be God means to be the one to whom all persons and things are accountable. This was man's goal, to be beyond good and evil, and to be beyond work and accountability. The association of royal status with battle, work and responsibility is very clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 24 to 28. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death, for he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith, All things are put under him, it is manifested that he is exempted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. We have here the work of Christ, the last Adam set forth, and the work of all who are members of his new humanity. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 21, For since by man came death, By man came also the resurrection of the dead. All men are, quote, made alive, end quote, who are in Christ by his redemption. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22. To be in Christ is to be a soldier in his holy warfare. It means arming for warfare against the powers of darkness. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 17. We are thus called to follow Christ in his warfare. The work of Christ, his warfare and dominion, is described here by Paul as, first, putting, down all rule and all authority and power. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 24. Only God's rule shall prevail. All other pretended powers and laws shall be put down. Christ thus establishes his dominion as the last Adam, and we, as members of his new humanity, are called to exercise dominion in and under him. All Christ's enemies shall be put under his feet. 
1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 25. However, this promise is to all Christians also. The God of peace shall bruise, or crush, Satan under your feet shortly. Romans chapter 16, verse 20. Second, the fall brought in the reign of sin and death. Before the end, sin will be effectually, but not totally broken and suppressed. All powers and principalities will be placed under Christ's feet. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 27. Then, at the end, with his coming again, death, the last enemy, shall be destroyed. Third, then Christ, the God-man, with total dominion, having been gained by his new humanity, now restored eternally to God's dominion service. Revelation chapter 22, verse 3. And his servants shall serve him, will yield the kingdom to the triune God. As Hodge noted, And as the delivery of the kingdom or royal authority over the universe committed to Christ after his resurrection is consistent at once with his continued dominion as God over all creatures and with his continued headship over his people, so is subjection here spoken of consistent with his eternal equality with the Father. It is not the subjection of the Son as Son, but of the Son as Theanthropos, of which the Apostle here speaks. God's purpose has been accomplished. Man has learned dominion, and man is now able to serve God perfectly throughout all eternity. Christ as King schools his covenant people, the new humanity, into their life as priests, prophets, and kings unto God. Having done so, he turns the kingdom over to the triune God as an eternally faithful, obedient, and perfect realm. The work of Christ as king is tied to the dominion mandate, Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28, and to our re-establishment in him for the fulfillment of that calling. Those who postpone Christ's kingship into the future, to heaven, or after the, quote, rapture, end quote, also postpone or abolish man's duty to exercise dominion. The result is a surrender of this world to Satan, a dereliction of the Christian's duty, and an open invitation for God's judgment 